This is going to be part three, and I promise this is this is not something that I'm going to uh, be harping on and continuing to preach about. This is um, I, I was actually not planning on preaching on this at all this week, but after uh, certain messages and things, I uh, just felt strongly impressed that maybe there were some loose ends still out there. It is a huge topic and wanted to just kind of uh, make sure that we, that we all um, have an understanding, a right understanding, that I have a right understanding. And um, so I wanted to go ahead and, and there's some really interesting, interesting uh, history here in this message today. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and just please uh, keep me in prayer as I go through this message here. And I know that the Lord is going to bless. But again, uh, this is not going to be something I'm going to continue to be preaching on. I just wanted to make sure um, that's not my objective anyway. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, everything is understood in the right light in which it's given. So um, with that, let's uh, pause for one added word of prayer. Dear most loving Heavenly Father, <clears throat> you're so gracious and uh, merciful unto us, and we just thank you for it. I pray that you would, again, send your Holy Spirit to minister unto our hearts, our minds, help us to um, gain a, a right understanding here, grant us the wisdom and discernment that we need. Please, Lord, forgive me and us of any sins that we may have uh, committed that... Um, I would be an empty vessel for you, that you would anoint my, my lips, my tongue with a coal from upon your altar, that all things said, presented here today would bring glory to you and you alone. I pray and ask these things in the dear and precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. God's Word or man's Word. People of the book. Who are the people of the book? What book are we talking about? We're talking about the Bible. And the people of the book are the people that follow what the Bible teaches and preaches, amen, and says. That's what the people of the book, who the people of the book are. But did you know that back in the day when the Seventh-day Adventist movement was beginning, starting, and coming into fruition that we, we gained the reputation of being the people of the book. Did you know that? There's actually, there was actually a book written, uh, Seventh-day Adventist, People of the Book. Um, it was uh, Review and Herald, published back in 1961. You can still get it. It's on um, Amazon and what have you. So, you know, it's, it's a real thing that we were considered to be the people of the book. Well, you know, it's interesting when you follow the Word of God and you believe His Word above the Word of man across whatever lines are out there, something phenomenal seems to happen in a large, uh, large part of the time. This right here. <laughs> People love to point fingers and laugh, right? Especially in particular, uh, when we're discussing this topic of creation, evolution, not going along with what the world prescribes, the scientists of today prescribe as truth and absolute scientific proof, they say. And you go contrary to that and you start, you start reading the Word of God and you see clearly in the Word of God that it does not line up with what God says. And you have to take a stand. What are the days in which we are living right now? We're in the last days. In the last days, 2 Peter 3.3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, what? Scoffers. Walking after their own lust. Jude 18, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. 2 Timothy 3 and onward, this 
Know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. What are blasphemers? Yeah, they're, they're, they're mocking the Word of God. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That's a whole other topic. Truce breakers, false accusers. Accusing us of believing in false doctrine. Incontentant, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. So you see, this is the, the results of sin manifested in our world today, that the word of man is esteemed so much higher than the word of God, that when you believe in the word of God, you, you actually stand on shaky ground that you are going to be ridiculed, accused, and mocked. How many of us love that? Nobody, right? Nobody wants to be mocked. Nobody wants to be uh, cast into a dark light in, in, uh, in that way. It's not a pleasant experience. You know, it's, it's interesting if we think about it, how indoctrination works. False indoctrination typically begins right at birth. We are told that, that such and such and thus and thus is so. Amen? This is something that we're, we are presented with from birth. That the earth is a globe. You go into your classrooms, in the very different classrooms. A lot of times they'll, the teacher will have a globe on the desk or up on the shelf or, or this, there, and wherever. That's what they teach. It gets, it gets ingrained in our minds to the point that it seems absolutely absurd that anything else could be truth. But yet, if we look at the Word of God, we see something completely contrary to this supposed truth. Anyone ever seen this map before? A couple of people, a few people have. This is a fascinating map. Um, it was, it was uh, originally made back in the uh, late 1800s. And uh, the history behind this map is, is pretty fascinating, to say the least. I want to zoom up to the top here and see what it says here. It says, Gleason's New Standard Map of the World as it is, is what he says there as it is. This is supposed to be the world as it is, according to this Gleason, whoever this Gleason is. Well, let's look at Gleason. This is he. His name is Alex or Alexander Gleason. That's him. That's a blown up picture of that map. And um, this has pretty much been the map that has been um, embraced by most people that believe that the earth is not a sphere, but a flat plane, more of a flat plane. Well, it's interesting if you look a little closer at this Mr. Gleason, he's also an author. He wrote a, a very fascinating book here. It says, is the Bible from heaven? Question mark. Is the earth a globe? So he wrote um, a nice book on this topic. I think it's interesting that he says right here on the cover, scientifically, theologically demonstrated. I like that. I really like that. Scientifically, I'm not saying that all science is bad, right? There's true science and there's pseudoscience. Theologically demonstrated. And he is the one that uh, made this map. Well, who is this guy? By the way, um, this is a link online that you can go to and you can read that book, Is the Bible from Heaven? Well, interesting history about him. Uh, this gentleman here with this awesome beard. I mean, that is an awesome beard. 
Uh, and then this is another interesting uh, gentleman here that we'll be talking about more in just a minute. But that's, uh, that's Alexander Gleason, uh, Gleason rather. And um, this is where it gets really interesting. This is at a New York conference mission in Buffalo. Buffalo, New York. Alex Gleason is responsible or is the one that started the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Buffalo, New York. He is a Seventh-day Adventist. Was. He's, of course, passed away. But he's the one that came up with that map. And Alex Gleason, very smart man, he was a blacksmith, obviously an author. He invented, he has uh, at least two patents that I'm aware of. Um, very smart man. And very, an important man within the Seventh-day Adventist organization in his day. At his burial, the conference was involved. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, the New York Conference president even did his funeral, if I'm not mistaken. So he was, if you want to say, a flat earther from way back. And um, he was a good, faithful Seventh-day Adventist till the day he died, as far as I know. He was. He was. Uh, he actually uh, worked in the New York Conference uh, as the in charge of the missions for uh, about three years. Eighty-seven. I think it was eighteen eighty-seven to eighteen ninety, somewhere around in there. Those dates may not be completely accurate, but nonetheless, um, this is another picture of the conference that was in Syracuse, New York. The camp meeting there, and uh, these are all the different ministers. Um, now. Um, as far as I know, I don't believe that Alex um, Gleason was a minister himself, although he did travel around and he did preach this message of the flat plain earth. He did do that. And at this is very interesting. At this, um, these camp meetings, he, was, uh, he worked very closely with uh, A.E. Place. And at this camp meeting, they actually took a vote. And... Um, we're going to see what that vote was here in just a second. Any of you uh, familiar with this gentleman here, Dudley Canwright? Well, Dudley Canwright, um, it's a very sad story what happened with Dudley Canwright. Um, he, was, uh, he was a minister. He worked very closely with Ellen White and James White. He actually lived with them for a time, worked very, very closely. They were dear, dear friends for some 27 years. Well, at some point, Ellen White gave him some rebuke for something he was doing. And he became embittered about that. And um, he began to uh, join up with his Sunday-keeping friends. And he joined their, their movement as opposed to the Seventh-day Adventist one. He actually wrote this book, Seventh-day Adventism Renounced. You can find that book online right there. And um, of course, for those online, I'll be posting up the link for it. But it's very sad that he was with the, the church for so long and so closely connected in friendship and working together with Ellen and James White to uh, have fall, fallen away so much. But in his book, he has... Um, he has a, a little bit of a jab at the ones who are, were at that conference there where they took a vote. Well, here it is. I've got it underlined here. The latest discovery is that that adopted by Seventh-day Adventist ministers of the New York Conference. It is that the earth is absolutely flat and stationary with the sun, moon, and stars much smaller than the earth and revolving around it. The sun, he do move, the old darky said, and they say, Amen. So he was very much against the flat earth, flat plane um, theology. And he was throwing jabs at them 
Because at that conference, they took a vote and they voted in the New York conference, they voted to accept the flat earth, this right here. They voted that as Seventh-day Adventist. And it's interesting too, um, the sun he do move, that was a quote from a Baptist minister. He was a, he was a black man. Uh, John Jasper was his name. And um, he had a very popular message at that time uh, entitled, The Sun He Do Move, because he believed also that the earth was a flat stationary plane and that the sun, moon, and stars evolved around the earth. So this was, can you see the kind of spirit that this man had? He was, he was making fun. He was mocking, okay? He was mocking the leaders at that time. I was um, sent this this week, and I am not uh, in any way upset about receiving this. I think it's great that I did receive it. I appreciate the email. Um, and this is, this is um, the quote here from My Life Today, uh, page 316. But the enemy, Satan, dare not go one hairbreadth beyond, beyond his appointed sphere. So you could see and maybe think that what Ellen White is saying here is that Satan is not allowed to go beyond the sphere of this world, okay? Well, as we know, in Ellen White's writings, we always must take things into context. So if we back up and we look at the full quote, uh, we will see a little bit a better, clearer picture of what she was uh, getting at. Satan was permitted to tempt the too confident Peter. So what is he doing? He's tempting Peter, right? As he had been permitted to attempt Job, but when that work was done, he had to retire. Had Satan been suffered to have his way, there would have been no hope for poor Peter. Now, if um, this hairbreadth beyond his appointed sphere applied, the way I see that, Peter would have had to have been raptured off of this earth because Peter was still in the sphere, if you want to say that, that the earth is a sphere, Peter was still here on this sphere. So there was nothing to keep him, Satan, from tempting him if that was the only implication there. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, if you, if you go and you do a search on sphere and the different times, uh, places where she talks about sphere, uh, she does it a lot, and it's a um, limited sphere of action, uh, she talks about sphere of influence. So it looks to me like what she's referring to there is Satan was held back from his sphere of influence against Peter because God said, no, that, that far, no further. Peter is down on his knees in the Garden of Eden confessing his sins. Amen? He was coming back to God, so he was not allowed to destroy him, okay, like he did Judas. So that's the reference there. I believe that it's a sphere of influence. So um, let's look at this next quote here. Now this one, this one is, is pretty strong. Uh, earnestly inquire. Let those who are presenting theories as to whether the earth is round or flat. I, I'm just going to face it full on, okay? Um, I received a, a, um, an email this week from another dear brother. And um, he had seen the video from last week, and he gave me some quotes. And um, I had seen those quotes, and so he was worried that maybe some of the present truthers out there might see uh, this message, and, and uh, it might end up hurting uh, our ministry here. So I want to look at these and just, just face the, the music head on, if you will. Let those who are presenting, present, presenting uh, theories as to whether the earth is round or flat leave this question, for God has not given it to them to solve, and earnestly inquire, what shall I do that I may have everlasting life? So we need to be earnestly inquiring, what shall we do that we would have everlasting life? Amen? We need to do that. You know, um, Ellen White never, as far as we know, as far as I know anyway, 
in my research, never rebuked Alex Gleason for his work. But she did rebuke Jay and Andrews. And what was Jay and Andrews doing? Jay and Andrews was trying his best, staying up all night, burning the midnight oil, trying to prove that the world is round. And you see, the impetus behind what Dudley Canwright was doing was he was saying too that the world is round, therefore you, if you go this direction so fast, so far, you can actually lose a day. So they're trying to split hairs as to where you know the times exactly end and begin as far as the Sabbath is concerned, if you're traveling around the world or what have you. And so it became, it, it, it kind of uh, festered into a real issue in that day. So Ellen White had a problem on her hand. She needed to silence this, this um, situation. And she did rebuke Jay and Andrews because he was staying up all night trying to prove that the world was round. And basically, at that time, especially, there was no way to tell absolutely, matter-of-factly, that the world was round or flat. It was just, it was, they just didn't have the technology that we have today. She said, God rested on the seventh day and set it apart for man to observe in honor of his creation of the heavens and the earth in six literal days. He blessed and sanctified and made holy the day of rest. When men are so careful to search and dig to see in regard to the precise period of time, we are to say God made his Sabbath for a round world when the seventh day comes to us in that round world controlled by the sun that rules the day, it is the time in all countries and lands to observe the Sabbath. Continuing on, in the countries where there is no sunset for months, and again, no sunrise for months, the period of time will be calculated by records kept. So if you're in the, um, at the North Pole or up in uh, Alaska, for instance, you know, there's about two months out of the year where the sun never sets. And then there's about two years, uh, two months out of the year that the sun never rises fully, okay? So she's, she's trying to tell these people that it doesn't, it doesn't matter um, about those particulars. Do what is right. Do what is right. Look at the records. See, she says, calculated by the records kept. So look for the period of times for the months where it did set and rise. And try to, you know, just be honest with the Lord about it. God knows our heart in those situations, okay? But God has a world large enough and proper and right for the human beings He has created to inhabit it without finding homes in those lands so objectionable in, in very many, many ways. The Sabbath was made for a round world and therefore obedience is required of the people that are in perfect cons consistency with the Lord's created world. Now, some people will say that there you have it. She says clearly, the world is round, end of discussion. Look at the date here. That's 1900, okay? Now look at this quote, 1904, four years later. A man was presented who had expressed a desire to see me and talk with me in regard to the round and flat world. I sent him a message that when Christ gave my commission to do the work he had placed upon me, the flat or round world was not included in the message. So this is after that previous comment saying that the world was round. So now she's clearly saying she doesn't know. God has not given it to her. Okay? So how can we take that previous slide, that previous quote, as being a, a matter of fact when she says in 1904 that God hadn't even given her a definitive answer whether the world was round or whether the world was flat? That wasn't the issue. Contextually speaking, that wasn't the issue. The issue that was being debated was whether or not if the world was round, if we could truly keep the Sabbath in a round world. So she wanted to just silence the situation, I think. Diffuse it. The Lord had taken care of His house, His world, here below, better than any human agency could care for it, and until 
The message came from the Lord. Silence was eloquence upon that question. 1904. Until the Lord manifests it and makes it apparent that it is important, silence is golden. Do you see that? Um, an interesting phenomenon, if you will, is happening today over the past several years, thanks to the internet activity and so forth. There has been a huge uprise in those believing in the very good possibility that we don't live on a ball. They're seeing the issues with that theory, okay? There is a number of people as a result of the teaching that the earth is a flat plane and that there is a globe over it just as prescribed and given to us from the book of Genesis. They're actually leaving atheism and coming over to Christianity. Wow. You see, when we're just one of many spherical worlds, um, uh, planets spinning around out there in space, we could just be an accident. And they have their mathematical equations. That they actually do. They have a mathematical equation that will tell you how all things could come from nothing. You see, this is a news headline here from uh, Live Science or Live Science. I'm not sure which one. Um, a third of young millennials are confused about this incontrovertible fact. Okay, it's an incontrovertible fact. And what is what does incontrovertible mean? It's not debatable. It's settled. It's a fact. It's not a theory. It's a fact. Okay, so what are they talking about? I'm sure you know. Only 66% of 18 to 24 year olds in the U.S. are confident that the world is round. Wow, according to a new national survey. Young millennials, or those 18 to 24, were the most likely to exhibit round earth skepticism, with only 66% firm in their belief in a spherical world. For comparison, 94% of those 90, uh, 55 and older think the world is round as do 85% of 45 to 54 year olds, 82% of 35 to 44 year olds, and 76% of 25 to 34 year olds. Do you see a trend here? The younger they are, the less they're believing in this spherical earth, this heliocentric model. That's the youth, that's the um, generation that is coming up here. And they're losing faith in this, and I say praise the Lord, losing faith in this heliocentric model. I'm personally very thankful about that because I don't think it's of God, obviously, and you will see more in just a minute. This is uh, just from our um, video that I posted up on just on Thursday. Um, uh, it's already, it already has, I think, 70 views or something like that. Um, multiple comments here that um, I, I just praise the Lord for. You see, people are finding out that what they've been taught all their life and what their parents and grandparents have been taught all their life may not be true. They're checking things out for their own, on their own. And these people who were once not Christians, now see that there's no way that if we are on a flat plane with a globe over it, just as prescribed in Genesis chapter 1 and the firmament, what do you think that happens? What happens in, the, in their mind? They begin to realize, you know what? I'm not a mistake. I'm not just happenstance. I'm here for a reason. God created this planet that I live on. It's not all by chance. I'm not just some cluster of molecules that don't matter. You see what I'm saying? And where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? 
when they discover these truths on their own and they want more truth, what are we going to say to them when they come to us and say, do you, you, you say that you believe in the Bible and the Bible is your standard, solo scriptura, as we believe as Adventists? What about creation? What about verse 6 where he's talking about the, the firmament and then the stars and the, and the sun and the moon being inside the firmament? How can that be possible on a globe earth? This brother that I was uh, referring to earlier, he, uh, in reference to the Ellen White's comment that it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't seem to be salvational, um, he sent me Psalms 100 and verse 5 uh, because I stated that, well, it may not have been salvific in her time, but now today it may become a salvific issue. And so he said, um, he sent me, you know, Psalms 100 and verse 5, that his truth endureth to all generations. In other words, what he was saying is if it was not salvific um, 100 years ago, it's not going to be salvific today. Okay. In the Old Testament, we have a sanctuary there in the Old Testament. And there were services that were conducted there in the Old Testament sanctuary. And as we recall, uh, little lambs or goats or a bull or what have you would be brought in. And the person would lay their hands that had committed the sins, would lay their hands and confess it on the lamb, or whatever the animal was. And then they would slit the lamb's throat. Was, there tr was that not all truth? Was that not all definitely salvific? Was that not important to their salvation? Absolutely it was. But now today, if I go and confess my sins on a lamb and slit its throat, I'm committing blasphemy because I'm saying that Christ's ultimate sacrifice is not good enough for me. I need to sacrifice a lamb. So you see, things can change. Applications can change over time and today we see that people are waking up to this truth and it is I believe important and even salvific the earth unmovable we're gonna look at some Bible text here to uh, concrete this this understanding here first Chronicles 1630 the world also shall be stable that it be not moved Psalms uh, 96 and verse 10, the world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. Does it sound like we're on a spinning ball here? Uh, the earth unmovable again. 1 Chronicles 16, 30. Well, I'm sorry, I'm reading the same one. Psalms uh, 93 and verse 1, the world also is established, established that it cannot be moved. So please tell me, how is this true? How is it possible that we're living on a spinning ball like that when the Bible says, that it shall not be moved. You see how it contradicts the Word of God clearly? Isaiah 11, 12, four corners of the earth. Revelation 7, 1, four corners of the earth. Revelation 20 and verse 8, the four corners of the earth. It's possible to have four corners, as seen here in this picture, but on a spinning ball, how do you have four corners? The earth is on pillars. 1 Samuel, Samuel 2 and verse 8, For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and He hath set the world upon them. Job 9 and verse 6, And the pillars thereof tremble. Psalms 75 and verse 3, I bear up the pillars of it. This seems a lot more applicable with a flat plane having some sort of foundation under it, pillars holding it up. This is also another um, artist's rendering from, of course, all through the Bible. This is what they believed. Up until about 500 years ago, this is what uh, the world believed. And you can see that there's columns and there's floodgates. i just just throwing this out there. Isn't, isn't it kind of difficult to flood a ball, by the way, speaking of the flood? But you see the floodgates of heaven, there's waters above the firmament, remember? And there's windows of heaven, we see that talk, spoken of in the Bible as well. 
So it would be very easy for God to open up the windows of heaven and pour in more water to, to flood the earth. I don't see any way that we can have pillars on a spinning ball. It just doesn't seem feasible to me. He stretcheth and spreadeth. Isaiah 44, 24, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Um, that's someone spreading something. And I don't see how a, a ball is going to be something that's spread. He bowed the heavens. Psalms 18 and verse 9, he bowed the heavens also. 2 Samuel 22:10, he bowed the heavens also. Now, if you look up in Strong's, it's uh, that word is H5186. And it says to stretch out, extend, spread out, bend, bow, right here, bend, bow, stretch, stretch, extend. It's uh, nothing about that says anything about being a ball, okay? Okay, it's like a tent. Isaiah 40 and verse 22. Again, we, we covered this last time, but I just want to make sure that we all understand what's being said here because so many use this text to say that, see, Isaiah says that the world is a ball. Clearly, the world is a ball. But is a circle a ball? Did Isaiah know, know the difference? I mean, because if you look here, it says sitteth upon the circle, but then here at the bottom it says as a tent to dwell in. And this is what a tent looks like. And it can sit nicely, a tent sits nicely on a flat plane. It's not a ball, it's a flat plane. It looks more like this, it's going to be a flat plane, something like that. And you say, well, you know, like we talked about last time, maybe Isaiah didn't know the difference between a circle and a ball, and that's just, that's just the only word that he could use to, uh, to, to, for it to make sense what he was talking about, and that's really what he meant was that it was a ball or that it was a, a sphere. Well, we look here at Isaiah 22 and verse 18. He clearly knew the difference between a circle and a ball. This was actually stated. This is Isaiah 22, so this was before Isaiah 40. So he, he states clearly, violently turn and toss thee like a ball. That is no question about it. We can't, get, we can't be confused on this point. It's very, very clear that uh, he was referring to a circle. He was not referring to a ball in Isaiah 40 and, and verse 22. Now look at all these scriptures. 67 scriptures stating that the sun moves and the earth is stationary. The sun moves, the earth is stationary. Look at this again and again, over and over. Just look at these as I scroll through them. We don't have time to go through every single one, um, but it's just amazing how many times that, that it is referred to as the, the earth is stationary and the sun, moon, and stars are moving around us, not the other way around. And so, Again, how many verses in the Bible say that the earth is spinning around the sun and that the earth is the aspect of our solar system that is spinning and moving? Absolutely none, friend. None. No text even hint to say that. It is a geocentric system that we are in. The earth is stationary. The sun, moon, and stars revolve around us, not the other way around. He compassed the waters. He hath compassed the waters with bounds, Job 26, 10. That sounds like a really good description of what we see with the flat earth model. This is a, an old picture from back in the 1800s. I think it's really in. This is a wall of ice surrounding the flat world. Uh, I'd really love to get a better image of that, but <clears throat> that's all I have right now. But I think that's a pretty uh, interesting uh, photo there or uh, drawing, rendering, I should say. The earth is a footstool. Isaiah 66, 1, the heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Matthew 5, 35, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Acts 7, 49, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. This is a footstool and this is a ball. There's a big difference between a footstool and a ball. Have you ever had a footstool that's spun around underneath your feet? It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. 
Okay, falling stars, Matthew 24, 29, the stars shall fall from heaven, Mark 13, 25, and the stars shall fall. Uh, Revelation 6, 13, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now, we are told that the stars of heaven are, are light years away from us and that they have their own energy, which they may. I, we don't know for sure, or at least I don't. But um, this event already took place. We studied it in the Great Controversy. Uh, star, star Shower, November 13, 1833. Its uh, sublimity and awful beauty still linger in many minds. Never did rain fall much thicker than the meteors fell toward the earth. East, west, north, and south, it was the same. In a word, the whole heaven seemed in motion. The display, as described in Professor uh, Silliman's journal, was seen all over North America from two o'clock until broad daylight, the sky uh, being perfectly serene and cloudless and an incessant pl play of dazzling, brilliant luminous, luminosities was kept up in the whole heavens. And that's Great Controversy, page 333. So we're to believe that these huge stars, which they also claim are suns actually, fell from the sky and, and were, were spinning through space at, um, at you know, uh, six, over 66,000 miles an hour we're going around the sun. And our whole solar system is rocketing through space at close to 500,000 miles per hour. I can't even imagine that. But somehow all the stars managed to fall on our little planet. This is how it looks at night when you do time-lapse photography. The stars rotate around Polaris, the North Star. They all rotate around the North Star. How is that possible? If we are flying through space at incomprehensible speeds, you can't even you can't even fathom those speeds. It's crazy, and it's always the same. It's in different locations in the sky, depending on the season, but it's always the North Star. Everything else spinning around it. Don't be deceived, Matthew 24, 24. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, let no man deceive you by any means. Ephesians 5, 6, let no man deceive you with vain words. Lies have always been a problem. We see it clearly here in Jeremiah's day, uh, 16 and verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth. I think it's interesting, the ends of the earth. There's also many mentions of the ends of the earth. How do you have ends to an earth that's a ball? You can't have ends to an earth that's a ball. There's no end to it. And shall say, surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. It was a problem in Jeremiah's day, and it's a problem today. Beware of philosophy and vain deceit, Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's what these people are. They're philosophers. Um, after the tradition of men. And why are they doing that? Because it proves evolution, they think. Because if you have a flat plane with a dome over it, and the stars and the sun and the moon are inside the dome, spinning around, there's no other explanation ultimately for that other than we have a loving Creator God that loved us so much. He put us in this protective tent, if you will, this covering over us so that we would have a habitable place to live. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, who is the Creator? Jesus Christ is our Creator. So in this heliocentric model, it totally undermines creation, the story of creation in Genesis. It undermines Jesus as our Creator. 
it totally just undermines the Bible altogether. You might as well just throw it out. You can't even, you have nothing to stand on if you start taking bits and pieces of the Word of God out. Amen? 1 Timothy 6.20, false science is going to be a problem. 1 Corinthians 3.19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. So that's supposedly what's happening right now. I feel absolutely no movement whatsoever. The sun is supposed to be almost 93 million miles away, but yet simple geometry would tell us that this is impossible if that was the case. If the sun were 93 million miles away, all the light would come in from one direction. And it would illuminate at least about half of the world at one time. I mean, I don't understand it all. I'm just saying it doesn't line up to me. How can we have all the different time zones so close together? I can't drive... Uh, we can't drive more than, you know, what, maybe 100 miles from here to the border of Alabama and the time changes. Why would it do that if we lived on a big ball with the sun 93,000 miles, a million miles away, shining on the whole side that it's on? It doesn't really add up to me. Again, this is the location of the sun. Follow the rays back. This is a street light. Follow the rays back. It's real simple, guys. It's, it's just not, it just doesn't make any sense. And this is another thing. I've seen several um, uh, examples of this where the sun is actually in front of some clouds. That is absolutely impossible if the sun is supposed to be 93 million miles away. There are no clouds 93 million miles away. It doesn't add up. Nothing is hid. All will be manifested. You see, the time will come where nothing will be hid anymore. The truth will be manifested. It will be made clear. I believe we are at the very precipice of that happening today. Luke 18, I'm, I'm sorry, Luke 8 and verse 16, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but uh, setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. So if we have light, we are not to cover it. That is why I present truthful messages as best as I know it, and God help me if I make a mistake. But as far as I can see, the story that's presented from the world is false. And it doesn't line up with the Word of God. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be made known and cometh abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear, for whatsoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have." We can lose our salvation if we do not put out our light, put our light out for the world to see. Amen. We just talked about that in, in the great controversy study this morning. We need to let our light shine. If we have truth, we need to be willing to present it as God leads. Just as God has made it. <clears throat> Another quote from uh, Spirit of Prophecy, it is better to pray and humble the soul before God and let the world, round or flat, be just as God has made it. That's what we need. This is, I want to say this, you know, this is um, just like back in um, our forefathers' time, men were spending a whole lot of time investing in this, and, and, I, and I did say in the last message to um, search this out for yourself, but I don't intend for anyone to uh, spend countless hours um, you know, on, on this particular topic. You know, this is, this is something that I think is pretty clear that there's an issue there and it needed to be brought to the attention of the people and to let, um, let others know where we stand as, as a people. Um, but I don't, I don't believe that it's something that we should spend countless days and hours researching and researching and on and on and on because, you know, there's an old saying about the rabbit hole, you know. You get going down that rabbit hole too far and you can get in trouble. So we need to make sure that uh, 
study these things, have an understanding of it from the Word of God, but do not let it distract us to the point that we could possibly lose our salvation and that we could possibly um, be a detriment and not, not be living up to the truths that we have and the, work that, the other work that we need to be doing. Understood? He is wisdom. Psalms 147 and verse 5, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. You know, there's another um, doctor, science professor, or something of that statue, and he has gone in, he's written a book, and he said, yes, the Bible does say that the earth is flat, but those were a bunch of uneducated men and women. They don't know what they're talking about. It's a bunch of foolishness. So he's saying that the earth is actually round, is what he believes, and that these guys were just misguided in the Word of God. I can't subscribe to that because I believe that all Scripture is inspired, is given of God. Amen? So, his understanding is infinite. Mine is not. I'm going to trust what the Bible says and what my, my God says, my Lord and Savior says. I'm not going to uh, base my faith on what the world says. Matthew 4, 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what we need. That needs to be our, our love, to base our faith completely and wholly upon the Word of God, not upon man and the theories of the world. Revelation 1, 7, Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him. And they also which pierced Him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Even so, Amen. Even so, Amen. I was um, a Sabbath school teacher at one of our other Conference Seventh-day Adventist churches. And we had a... A gentleman that came in, he was very excited about the truth. He had seen uh, some messages, I believe, from Doug Batchelor online, and he was like, Doug Batchelor, his, his message is lining up with the Word of God. So, you know, I wanted to find a, a Seventh-day Adventist church, you know, because he's, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. So you, you guys have the answer. So Sabbath school class, one Sabbath, um, we were talking about this very text. And um, he said, yeah, you can tell, you know, you know that today... It's very easy to see how that could happen because we have computers, we have the laptops, we have the phones, all these things. So it'll be very easy for every eye to see Jesus. We know that Satan cannot completely duplicate what Christ is going to do in His second coming. Remember that? Scripture about when you hear he's in the secret chambers or he's over here, he's over there, don't go. I fear that when, and we've seen it many times, whenever a grand event happens in our world, everything can be taken over. All of our devices, our TVs, our computers, all these things can be taken over. And we are, we are instructed to turn from these things, not even look at them whenever this happens, because Satan's influence is going to be so strong, his deception in uh, um, duplicating or trying to um, counterfeit the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be so strong, so convincing, and so compelling and powerful. The deception there could be very easy if we believe that, that the second coming of Christ is going to be broadcast on televisions that God has to rely on a man-made source to get His message out there that He's coming again to save us, I think that that could be a real problem. When he said that, when he, when he made that statement, I said, you know, I, of course I didn't know anything about the whole flat earth thing at that time. And I said, you know, God, we, we should never put God in a box. He could flatten this world out if he needed to, to do what he needed to do to prove and to, to reveal himself to all of us at once. He doesn't need electronic devices to do that. So we can see how that could be a very um, plausible deception in the last days 
when Christ, uh, when when Satan actually tries to duplicate or tries to counterfeit the second coming. And uh, if we believe that we live on a ball and that there's no way that God can reveal himself to us all at once, we could fall prey to that deception. So be careful, friends. I just, I just want to make sure that we understand that we need to be, it, it, we need to stick to the word of God. We need to be people of the book still today. We began as people of the book. We need to still be people of the book today. Amen.